Hello. I'm Harris M. Berger. I'm director of MMAP, the research center for the study of music, media, and place at Memorial University of Newfoundland. On November 3rd, 2016, in the MMAP gallery, the center presented a screening of the video The Music of Survival, the story of the Ukrainian Bondurist Chorus by filmmaker Orest Sushko. After the screening, Dr. Brian Cherwick from Memorial University's Folklore Department presented a public interview with Mr. Sushko, which included questions from the audience in the gallery. The following video is a record of that interview. There are some technical issues with the video, which in some passages are very dark. But the discussion is fascinating, and I hope that you find it as interesting as everyone in the gallery that night did. And now, Orest Sushko and Brian Cherwick on the music of survival. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming out uh, to this evening's uh, showing of this film. Uh, just a brief introduction of, uh, of Orst. Uh, Orst is uh, an award-winning award uh, post-audio uh, editor in the film industry. Uh, he's worked with uh, film directors such as uh, David Cronenberg, uh, uh, Goodness, I should have written them down. Um, I, I've worked with David, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, uh, Guillermo del Toro, um, ba basically directors across North America, having spent time here in Los Angeles. And then also working in the television industry where he won an Emmy Award, and also he's here visiting us in Newfoundland right now because he's working with uh, the production company that's working on the new Newfoundland production called Frontier. So. Uh, so we'd like to welcome Orest here to, uh, to Newfoundland. And uh, I thought I might just start out asking a, a couple of general questions of you, Orest. Uh, first would be uh, a, a kind of a really general question. What, what was the impetus for you to, uh, to make this film? Um, I think what really kind of inspired me, there, there were two things. There was a, a personal family side, but the, one was just circumstance. I had. A friend of mine had told me about a film, I'm not sure how many of you had heard of it, called Standing in the Shadows of Motown, about, uh, about a group of musicians known as the Funk Brothers. And they were the backbone of the uh, Motown musical movement, and they defined a greater part of American musical culture. And I happened to be sitting in a theater about this size, and I was um, watching the film, and as it or un unfolded in front of my eyes, I started to see what a wonderful tribute it was to this group of musicians that essentially died without any form of notoriety or knowledge to the general public of their contributions to that part of their culture. And then this sort of light bulb went on in my pea brain and said, there's a wonderful story somewhere in this group of Ukrainian gentlemen that defined a, a greater part of Ukrainian musical culture during a very turbulent period in history. And I thought, well, if I sort of look at the effect that that particular film had had on me, uh, Standing in the Shadows, I thought there'd be something I could do to sort of reciprocate uh, to my community and pay tribute to this group of men. So um, I was also coupled with the fact that my father was the first Canadian member of the Corps who had met the group in uh, Ukraine during the war period and then again in the um, displaced person camps. And after learning of his story and his early involvement in the group, um, he had mentioned that these last two gentlemen, who were the last two survivors, were still alive. So all these pieces started to sort of cosmically and spiritually come into place. And I thought, well, I shouldn't uh, waste that opportunity. So lo and behold, this was, after 10 years, the end result of that work. Uh, you touched on something, and I want to ask you sort of a little bit about the process of of how you went about uh, putting this film together? Uh, well, I did it probably in reverse order, the way most people would conventionally make a documentary film. I hadn't made a documentary film before this time, but because I work in production in the industry, I sort of, I guess through osmosis, had seen and heard a lot of how the process comes together. And a producer colleague of mine said, uh, I told him I had this idea, and he says, oh, you can do it. And I said, well, I've never done it before. And he said, you probably know how to do it. You just need to go through the steps. Um, but my main concern was to be able to record and film these last survivors. So at its cornerstone, in its cornerstone, this film is really just oral and visual history of two men depicting their story. So I actually set about to record and film them without having too much in-depth knowledge of the story arc itself. 
but I knew that I had to capture their stories first while they were still healthy and ambulatory and able to, you know, had good, strong memories of that period. So I sort of went out without too much inkling of the story and just filmed them. And it was much less of an interview. It was much more of just make sure that camera's got enough film on it because once I start, I'm just going to keep going. So both these gentlemen basically delivered about four to six hours of interview information. And the magic really set in when we recorded the youngest one, Petroa, on a Saturday in Detroit. And it wasn't like he called Nicola and said, here's the questions he asked me. It was just, it just came out of them. And I started to see at that point how you could hang the entire narrative pretty much on them. So I kind of started with just those building blocks and then started to find ways to substantiate their story and galvanize it in a broader context. So most people would sort of put a script together and get their strong ideologies together for the film and then go find their pieces. I sort of went and got the pieces that I needed to first and worked from there. And a little bit about, you know, looking for those pieces, because the film kind of goes in a lot of different directions, uh, you know, beyond the story of those particular individuals. And, and how do you go about, you know, finding all of those component parts? Well, it was kind of a need, some things, and I think for many documentarians or people who make these types of projects, a lot of things, just like life is circumstance and how you find or happen to come by certain things. Um, I reached out to a visual researcher, a woman named Elizabeth Klink in Toronto, who's one of Canada's sort of top premier visual researchers, because I was dealing with a very niche story. And she had contacts across the globe through various personal private collections, uh, broader collections like Getty Images, WPA Library. And I sort of went all down those avenues looking for instruments uh, or looking for any reference to this instrument from that era. And then I also combed through the global Ukrainian diaspora. So I sort of cast the net out on my own. And through both those basic tributaries, we were able to slowly find pieces. But it, it never really came when you wanted it or needed it. We'd often start editing structure together. And then lo and behold, my editor would say, well, photos are great, but footage would be even better if you can find moving footage. Um, so oftentimes I'd find a placeholder in a, some sort of photograph, but then just continue sort of pulling on the research string. And, at a certain point, we were fortunate enough where in some parts of the story we had an embarrassment of riches where we had so many things to choose from and other aspects of the history we were very lean on. So I just had to pull on the string harder in those particular periods. But um, uh, under Elizabeth's guidance and just some gems that came out of the diaspora the woodwork, I was able to, we were able to kind of cobble it together with some pretty good visual format. I wanted to ask you a little bit of just about the, the, if you could speak a bit about the, the, the story of the course itself. Like, I mean, we heard a lot of it in the film, but what kind of things were sort of new information for you or new information, say, for the, for the audience of your film? Well, I think the things that I had learned uh, as I was going through the film was just the fact of there were various sort of sort of uh, incarnations of that group that had formed. Uh, in 1918, there was that group which survived for a couple of years. Some members of, uh, of that early group were persecuted and shot, or assassinated, etc. And then there was another group that formed in eastern Ukraine in 1923. And you started to have this sort of flow of musicians across the country. Uh, they would sort of come together and get together and make these smaller collectives and then another incarnation of the group might appear, not that particular group, but I started to see that sort of the popularity of the instrument rise and hence that reference to the comment where by the end of the 1920s there were over 800 ensembles. So that was a facet of the group's history through that early epoch that I wasn't really aware of all that much. Um, there was more knowledge that was clear about the group once they got to North America and their development here and especially also in the, um, the post-war years in the displaced camps. But that early part of their history of how it was, there were sort of these fragments really kind of interested me. We had to sort of simplify that a little bit in the storyline just because um, a documentary uh, is a different kind of piece of journalism where you have to sort of relay it to a viewer. You have to be able to sit and watch it and it has to flow. So there were certain complexities in there that we sort of had to um, modulate a little bit. But I, I thought it was important to include that point of 800 ensembles that sort of created, that were, that were present at that time. And um, this, your film kind of focuses on a particular like uh, period 
sp specifically in that interwar and war period. And uh, it talks a lot about the uh, effect that the ensemble had on their audiences, you know, during that time. Uh, could you uh, maybe speak a little bit about once they arrived in America, was there a similar kind of effect? I think there was. They, they, they're, they had some opportunities to play beyond their community, but because the, their community, like so many other, uh, other aspects or other members of other immigrant communities, had suffered so much during that period that they really decided to stay close to home and play a lot for their audiences. So that sort of dictated their repertoire and, and the types of songs they chose. And they chose a lot of material that you know, sort of created this longing for the homeland. There were a lot of people that were essentially in that same position that were exiled that couldn't go back for fear of you know, some sort of treatment. And um, they really sort of became this beacon of hope and growth in, the, in North American development in terms of that process. The, one of my um, academic advisors, one of the historians on the film, is a gentleman named Dr. Uh, Hiroyaki Kurumiya from University of Indiana. And he had written a book called um, Stalin Voices of the Dead and actually had access to the early archives, I believe, in the 90s. And he wrote a chapter in his book on these musicians um, during that period. And he wrote a lot about how when people heard the instrument, it literally made them weep. It just, there was just something about it that drew out all this emotional sort of drew this emotion out of their being and they really connected with it and I think that's something that the group or through these two gentlemen had noted especially playing for those children in those camps that they also were able to not were able to but that same feeling came out you know in a kind of a multi-generational component and the film touches briefly upon you know some more uh, contemporary uh, questions like uh, the group returned to Ukraine. How, how was it received when it, when it went back in 1991? I think it was very moving um, for them. I remember asking uh, Petro, the youngest of the two survivors, I said, you know, what was it like for you to go back after 50 years of not being there and performing on some of those same stages? And he, he had this very funny anecdote. It was very heartwarming where he said when he actually walked onto the, one of those stages that they played on, he remembered as a 15-year-old boy or 16-year-old boy one of the planks that was sort of broken on the stage. And the first thing he did when he got onto the stage was sort of look for that plank <laughs> to see if it was still in that same orientation or if they had refurbished anything. So I think for them it was kind of a time warp. You know, a number of the musicians never did make it back. Um, um, but I think it was very, very moving. And, and that's where you started to see that multi-generational component. Um, in fact, one or two of the, um, actually two of the other people who speak in the film, Alec McCly and Victor Mishala, are both in the group as youngsters in 1991 in some of that footage. So um, I think it was very moving for both the younger generation and the older generation. Be moving for the performers. I was wondering about the audiences that they played for. Like how were they received when they returned? I think it was a huge renaissance period at the time because my understanding is that there was, uh, this group was essentially exiled from their homeland and were forced west and then onward to North America. But there was another group, a chorus, that developed again, but it was no longer in this cradle of culture. It was sort of fallen under a government legislative mandate and repertoire was dictated, etc. So it was sort of a, a repeat of the 30s in that era. So I think when this group came back, many just didn't realize that there was even a group that had left and gone. So it was sort of a big surprise. And for them to realize that this culture was still being maintained all the way across the ocean for so long, for decades, and that it had more importantly proliferated, and a whole younger generation of instrument or instrumentalists and performers had, had spawned was was a real joy for them. So I think I, I would admit I would imagine they were taken by surprise. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. I was wondering if you if you have any idea about like what kind of influence it had on that musical culture. In Ukraine after the time of their, of their return. Yeah. I imagine it prompted sort of a, a rebirth of the instrument to some extent. You might be able to speak to that through some of your knowledge, but I think that uh, ultimately it probably created, uh, you know, broadened that interest level and exposure. And um, I know just in the short time that the film has been out, there have been a number of people. Um, it was, this was something we had a conversation about earlier on in making of the film. Not sure how many of you are aware, but Brian was actually my script editor on the film and quite involved early on in the process with me and throughout. But we had, um, when we had talked about it sort of being kind of a diaspora story, 
And when some youngsters and some of the elders had seen it still in Ukraine now, they were quite moved by the history because it was something that they hadn't witnessed. They, they weren't privy to some of that information. So I kind of referred back to some of like the Ken Burns documentaries about um, the history of jazz or the American Civil War, how it more so say the history of jazz, how it gave Americans a greater appreciation of their own musical culture. I think this story, by virtue of those audiences in 91 learning it and now through the film, have a deeper appreciation for their own culture. So. And, and maybe one more thing, just uh, the audiences in North America, so you kind of showed like at the very end here, uh, the sort of the youth camps and mm -hmm. young people learning this instrument, and, and how has that kind of developed since the time that the chorus has uh, you know, come to the States? I think it's, it's really, really spawned a lot more interest in playing. I mean, there have just been a, a number of people that have either since seeing the film or just seeing a resurgence of the group in the last couple of decades that here in North America, they've started to physically pick up the instrument. It's not the most accessible instrument. There's only probably two craftsmen left in North America, one in Canada and one in the U.S. that are physically making the instruments, but it's really spawned a lot of growth. In fact, um, just this past weekend in Detroit and Cleveland, there's an entire women's ensemble that has formed, and there were women's ensembles in the 60s based in Detroit, but that had sort of petered out over the decades. So now there were about two, initially started with two or three younger girls who were at some of these summer camps that said, we got to put a women's ensemble together because this older course was sort of a men's club. And they said, we really need to put this together. And they decided that we're going to find 15, 20 women who play the instrument and we're going to start this. So they had their inaugural concert this weekend. So I think it's definitely proliferating much deeper into the community now. And I, and I hope it continues. And do you see uh, kind of uh, renewed interest in the instrument in, the, in recent years? I think so. I think the one challenge that exists right now is finding instruments. And for many people, you know, having access to them, oftentimes the, um, the younger kids who are playing them are playing these big full-size instruments like we have behind us. And they can be a little bit big and cumbersome. There, there was a, a period where there were certain instrument makers building half-size models that kids could pick up and play. So an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old could manage an instrument and put it on their lap for X amount of period of time. But I think that uh, if they have access to instruments, so I don't see why it won't continue to increase and <coughs> grow in popularity. I'd like to see it more in the mainstream. Um, every uh, Some of the composers I've worked with over the years, uh, I've often sort of tugged at their sleeve, and if they're doing period pieces or certain types of musical styles in their compositions, you know, if, if it's something they would consider. And uh, very few of them, not very few, but not a lot of them had heard about the instrument. And uh, I was just fortunate that we could make the music sort of the central engine of the film, and that people who see it or aren't of Ukrainian background can appreciate that um, sort of the otherness of the Ukrainian culture in some ways. Sure, maybe a last question is just like, through this film, is there a, maybe a way f to get uh, a better understanding about this tradition to a wider audience, like you mentioned, perhaps beyond that small community that the uh, chorus predominantly performs for? I, I, I think there is, and I again, I, I guess because I, I sort of have this avenue that within which I work, and when I work with some of these composers, you know, it's the one gentleman who had seen the film early on had thought, you know, it's it's a very painful story to watch, but it's also a very um, interesting piece of history, both musically and politically, and the how those two are intertwined. That it's it's worth introducing that to a broader audience. Um, but I do think that there's something to be said about the instrument and its ability to be able to kind of transcend and create a sense of um, strong emotion for people and it can be I, I'm confident it can be adapted in various ways musically for a wider audience. Do we have uh, perhaps maybe some other questions from, from the floor or something? Just one back there. Oh. <laughs> I just had uh, one question. I was, and I hope it's not a, a very silly question, but I was wondering about the um, the design of on the violin. It would be F holes, but the, the sound holes on the instrument. I noticed there's in the in the video it tends to be this sort of flower shape, and sometimes there's a few others. I was just wondering if you about the construction of the instrument, if there's significance in the design in that aspect. Oh, of the of the sound holes mm -hmm. itself. Um, I'm not sure. Historically, I mean, I think that some of them chose sort of a, a sunflower pattern. I guess these are both variants on 
This instrument actually was built by Orr's grandfather. So he was one of the one of the few builders in North America and actually built several instruments for the, the Bondor's chorus, did he not? Yes, he did early on. He, um, he was, uh, along with my father, my grandfather was a, obviously a huge inspiration in, in the process of making the film, but um, he had learned, he was a blacksmith and he grew up, uh, well, he grew up in Ukraine, but when he emigrated to Canada, he uh, still applied the blacksmith trade, and um, he was then approached by um, a couple of people who were playing at the time, and they decided that uh, they needed some instruments made, so he sort of cross-platformed his knowledge and started building instruments at that time. Um, but I think he chose the sunflower design more out of personal preference, to answer your question. I don't think there was anything... I, I've seen various incarnations where people have had a single, just a full round hole, and then they've had a, I have one instrument that has a second smaller hole up top. And acoustically, there might be some, you know, some facet for greater resonance there. One of the instruments in the film, actually the elder gentleman, Nicola, who's now passed, he built instruments up to his mid-90s. And he had this sort of floral design in the top part where his sound hole was actually up here. And then there are other instruments you see in the course where they have no sound hole. And there was always this, well, is it louder with the sound hole? Is it not louder? And, I think it's really just a difference in tonality. So I imagine there's some change, but... There's also, like, a, from a folkloric point of view, one of the, one of the things is that it, it represents the sun as well as a flower, so it's supposed to be like a solar symbol. And uh, so uh, that's a, 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 what do you call it, a romantic kind of uh, description. A more practical description is if you take a circle and keep moving it around, and drawing around the outsides of that circle, you can make that that six-pointed star really easily by 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 uh, you know retracing the circle in different places. So geometrically, it's just an easy way to cut the sound hole. <laughs> so it's a bit of both. There, he's demystified it for you. Yeah. <laughs> there was another question somewhere in the center here. <laughs> Uh, did you screen uh, the film? Does it work? I think so. I can hear you though. <laughs> did you screen the film in Ukraine or do you plan to do that? Very interesting question. We were just speaking about that tonight. Um, there is a, a plan in the works. It's still being formulated about screening it um, across a number of universities there throughout the country. Um, hopefully sometime next year and doing sort of a premiere screening in both CAVE and VIEW. Uh, for those two larger communities. So it's in the works. Um, one of the things I found was challenging was that um, just getting it out within the Ukrainian community first has been quite a bit of effort just in terms of getting to all the different locales. So In North America. In North America, yeah. So we've, we've had an opportunity to showcase in a number of the communities both across Canada and a lot of cities in the U.S. and Ukraine was sort of the next step after that. But it's definitely on the map, as it were. Um, and I'm you hoping next should year. say there's also a Ukrainian language variant of this film. So there's one with uh, narration in Ukrainian. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, my, my concern was um, always to, or not concern, but my goal was to sort of try and make this a story that wouldn't just speak to the Ukrainian community, but could transcend that and bring deeper understanding of this story to a wider audience. So although it's foreign language by and large, um, we tried to structure it in a way that, you know, gives enough history and enough resonance. Um, one of the filmmakers I'd worked with who had seen it, um, an early incarnation, a rough cut, if you will, of the film, before I had any of the history component in, he just saw some of the Talking Heads footage, and it was sort of this promotional I'd cut together. And um, he had said, it's pretty powerful stuff from these two gentlemen. I didn't realize that a musical instrument could do this for a country or a nation at the time. And I said, absolutely. And he goes, you're going to put an entire retrospective on the front of it. And he's, he's a mainstream director. And I said, absolutely. He goes, good, because most people know nothing about nothing. And you sort of have to educate them. So I think in terms of the structure of the film and how it spoke, I, I really felt that that historical retrospective was, was quite important to do without getting too bogged down, but just keeping the pertinent points. So I'm actually hoping that that facet in Ukraine gives them some further enlightenment to a period or an epoch of history that they weren't perhaps grew up in or didn't hear those stories the way we did here in the diaspora. So. Any other questions? Uh -huh. If you were to start from scratch, what would you do differently? <laughs> <laughs> I try and finish it faster. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> I think um, I, I don't think I'd be able to do the first part differently in the sense of the interviews because that to me was sort of the key part to do. Um, I think I would um, I would probably obsess about things a little bit less. <laughs> I think I worried about so many things, uh, you know, just in terms of the physical production process. My editor had an interesting uh, bit of advice for me before I boarded the flight to Ukraine to travel and shoot across the country for nine days. He said, or it's, it's like documentaries are like real life. No matter how much you plan and plan and plan, something's going to happen when you get there. And it's going to test your mettle. And it's going to test who you are and how you adapt to stress and changes like we all have to adapt to those things. It's, it's what happens to you on a Tuesday afternoon that can change everything. And so when we got there, invariably, there were challenges. And I really started to sweat some of those challenges too much. But I think ultimately, pieces came together. So I think I would just worry less. I don't know if I'd do anything different. I would just worry much less about it. Because um, I had an opportunity to work with um, um, an editor who's not Ukrainian, who's uh, of Chinese background, and uh, he didn't speak a stitch of Ukrainian, and I thought that would be a huge barrier. But in a way, it was a really, really great opportunity for me to divorce myself from my own ideas and things that may have been near and dear to me. Um, when you work with someone and collaborate with someone from a different uh, a background, it just helps kind of separate the wheat from the chaff in, in certain ways. So uh, I definitely wouldn't change that part of working with, you know, working with people beyond my um, sort of ethnic boundary, if you will. Um, but I think the worry less would be, would be something I would do, do much less. <laughs> Good advice for academics. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Here. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a fascinating film. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It was really interesting to hear about it. Um, if I understood, in the 1920s, it sounded like there was a shift under, under the Soviet Union for a period when they were more open to a period when they were really clamping down on the repertoire. Was that, did that shift come from Lenin to Stalin? Is that, is that what led to that? Or what, what, what was the historical context for that? I'm not sure what the catalyst was within the administration at the time, but there definitely was this period of Ukrainianization in the 20s where um, things were being supported and promoted much, much more. And then there was this reversal. And in some, I think some facets of society, there was a complete and utter reversal. And in other facets of society, there were certain policies that were shifted incrementally that'll, that sort of force this change. Exactly what point in the administration they were in at that time um, was an area that I didn't address too, too much in the film specifically, but I'd imagine it would probably um, be in and around that period. There's just the pre-Stalinist there. Uh, and so there, there was a period where it was trying to catch bees with honey. And so, you know, in order to get people to buy into the Soviet system, they kind of allowed more freedom for individual ethnic expression. And then uh, when South Stalin came to power, that, that all got reversed. This is maybe an obscure question, but if you don't mind me asking, in the per I know that in the period before the Russian Revolution, there was lots of ferment of radical left parties in the uh, edges of the, the Russian Empire. Was there any attempt by those groups to mobilize the Bandura for, for political change, or was it... Mm, not that I'm aware of specifically in that period. Um, I can't, I wouldn't really be able to speak to that too clearly. I'm not 100% sure of that that sort of movement or anything that happened in there, unless you're aware of something. Prior to the revolution, you'd have mostly like s s individual solo musicians. So they basically played that repertoire of like historic epics, uh, uh, moralistic songs, uh, religious based things like things like that. So it was probably after the after the time of the revolution and after that uh, the 1902 that con Congress. Congress where they brought together a whole bunch of uh, uh, solo bards and tried to make an ensemble out of them that it kind of took on more more of that political baggage. I mean there were there were attempts to sort of take that take this instrument to more of a symphonic height at that point and integrate it with orchestras and, and all that sort of thing but then that all got sort of curtailed you know eventually with those reversal of policies and such so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you tell us a bit about the Oops, just hold on a second. Uh, can you just tell us a bit about the modern ensemble and like the membership? Um, oh, sure. Like, are there people, well, many people who like, like 
children? The demographic, you mean? Uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, hugely multi-generational. I think the age span is anywhere from 16 to 85. Um, so it's, it's, much, it's become, and always was, sort of a brotherhood where we're, we were all just sort of filling shoes. I, I was an active member until about 06 before I moved to California, and now I'm literally just picking up the instrument again because the film was sort of my instrument for a decade. But um, it's, yeah, there's a lot of, I won't say a lot of sons and daughters, but again, just younger people that are interested in playing the instrument who have had exposure to it through their communities or through elder players and such. But um, it's a pretty wide, wide age range. You know, the, um, in the early days, most every, you had a, the ratio of bandura players to choral singers only was much higher, a lot more instrumentalists over time, and these were professional musical groups, but over time here in North America, it's hard for them to maintain that sort of full-on professional status because mm -hmm. the, the players aren't played to perform or paid to perform, and you bring students on, students have exams, students have school schedules, so invariably the, um, the musical uh, front row shrinks and ex sort of and expands in size, so you have a large choral component, but you still, you still do have a good base of instrumentalists. Um, the instrumentalists, yeah, there's a pretty good age range in there as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's pretty varied. There was another question. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I... There's a photo where they're bordering, bordering a plane. Yes. Um, it seems like they're all carrying on their bandoras. Carry on, yeah. Yeah, how, <laughs> that's so cool. But... <laughs> I don't know how where they did, Where did they put them? <laughs> I think they could also bring their own bottled water on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or toothpaste. 20, 21 members, is that? Uh, well, the, the group flexed in size. So ultimately, you know, early on it was this sort of 17 that were reformed in Kiev or in Kiev. Um, actually, what happened in um, post-war Germany in the displaced persons camp, they had met up with another Ukrainian choral group, which was largely a choir, and they had sort of joined forces. Um, and this musical director joined with Rehori Kitas, the, the director of the course, and they had this much bigger group. So the group sort of inflated in size in post-war Germany, and uh, they then came across largely as a group through collective sponsorship to North America, and then the group probably shrank a little bit more in size. So there was always this changing of the guard. Certain people were leaving the group at that point, and certain people coming on. But. Um, yeah, it, it varied in size. So we, that was another challenge in the film is, you know, keeping it to a certain sort of number, but the actual number, once, once they started to move past the war, you started to kind of increase uh, in many ways. Uh, any other questions? Just, just a comment to that question. Well, this film is a... Um, shows the triumph of, of the spirit of this, this chorus, this group of men. I, I just can't help feeling an incredible sadness that this poor country is once again under the shadow of the, the Russians. And it's just, uh, just uh, very sad. Yeah, it, 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 it's, the comment's very interesting and, and poignant for the reasons you mentioned. Um, we started this movie, you know, before a lot of the current activity has been happening in Ukraine, and I think you know I'm just a, a student of history like we all are, and you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen. But um, that that comment has come up quite a number of times, and uh, I'm just very I just feel very fortunate to have a chance for those gentlemen to entrust me to put their stories, you know, on, in in some sort of formal form. Um, I. I that was probably when Maria asked earlier, you know, if I would change anything, um, you know, the, the one thing I definitely would never change would be, you know, how closely, not closely, but how intimately I could work with both those gentlemen. Um, I not only had the benefit uh, of a visual researcher or someone that could work with me in the, beyond the diaspora, but um, I had both those gentlemen to help me understand some of the more intricacies. You know, it's a pretty complex portrait. and they would never really refer to today's events, but um, I, I realized how blessed I was to be able to kind of have them comment on certain things and help kind of grind me into a certain perspective of what they went through. But just their ability to recall some details and memories. I would find a photo, for example, in a book of that 
place where they were incarcerated, Shupin 43. And I thought, well, if there's a photo, there must be some film footage. And when I was working in California, there was, uh, I'm going a bit off tangent here, but I'll share with you a short anecdote. When I moved to California, I thought, this is going to make it harder for me to finish the film. And a producer friend of mine said, no, you're going to meet people that you'd never meet in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver in terms of the film business. And I met a picture editor whose son was a PhD grad student in Berlin. And he read the script and he really liked the story and he was you know, very strong at research. And I sent him from Berlin to Hamburg to do some reconnaissance and start to dig up archives. So he went out there and he spoke to the local archivists mm -hmm. and uh, he found a little quick time clip of something on a piece of film which he transferred. And we thought it was the camp, but we weren't sure. And we had to be really sure because you have to float it on <laughs> academic principles. And I sent that little clip to Petro, the youngest survivor, and he would go, yep, I remember the tracks, I remember this, I remember that. And, and uh, it, it was great having that sort of instant validation or not, you know, so if certain things weren't correct, we wouldn't put them in. But I, I do remember those gentlemen referring to, you know, Ukraine in its current state. But um, the, uh, sadly, the eldest died uh, the last February at 104. Um, so he, he saw, he seen some of the change or was witness to some of the change. But uh, I know that it was, it was always very painful then to leave. And, um, and in some ways, um, yeah, I'm sure they wouldn't be all that comfortable with everything that's happening now. So. Any other questions? That one in the back. Um, was there anything that you couldn't include in the film, like anything you didn't find enough information on, or a person you wanted to interview that, for whatever reason, you didn't get to include? Um, I think in m most cases, we, we found pretty much everything we sort of needed at a certain point. There, there was actually the son of Rehori, um, Andy Katasti, who lives in San Diego, who's also quite a strong uh, musician and my, uh, you know, a, a master of the instrument. Um, but so he would have been someone that I, I would have wanted to include as just sort of that, again, another component of that direct ancestry who could speak to a lot of his father's experience. Um, but by and large, I was very fortunate just to get the people that I had. And um, I wanted to make sure like people like Victor, who's a, a historian who's very strong on the in knowledge of the instrument, that um, he was also one of the early members of the group uh, that, that trained under and studied under some of those gentlemen. So um, no, I, I, w I was very fortunate at this point. I, I'd have to say uh, I walked away from it at a good time in terms of that. There's always that. There's always that challenge of wanting to get more and more, and then a friend of mine reminded, reminded me that uh, perfect is the enemy of good, <laughs> and that you can just keep going too far. So, Maybe on that note, so that we don't go too far <laughs> with all this discussion. Uh, thanks, Horst. And